Thank you, Brother Bless you. You may be seated. To see my glory, yea, thou shalt behold those things which thou hast desired. And the Lord thy God shall be real unto thee if thou wilt but open thine heart and believe. For now said the Lord, thou shalt also behold my radiance, and the anointing of my spirit shall be upon thee. Rejoice therefore and be strong, for I am in the midst of those who worship me. Praise be in thy midst those things which thou hast heard of, and thou shalt run with the story, yea, even unto others who know not. For this is an hour of good tidings, yea, there forth far and near the message of my power. Thou shalt also receive of my spirit a fresh anointing, and thou shalt not fear to do these things. Amen. What a grand thing it is tonight to hear this said just before we, for us, come to speak to you. God promised in us that he will give us a fresh anointing. Yes, that's why we have assembled here. That's why this meeting is called. I certainly deem this such a grand privilege to be here tonight, to assemble with this church again, these worshipers, with my good friend, Brother Moore, his lovely wife and their family, and all the families of the Lord that has gathered out for this time of fellowship, <coughs> jubilee. We gather around the Word of God and around the praises and worship of His people. And I certainly miss something of not being here to hear our brother speak of the outpouring at the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street in Los Angeles. And I sent the tape man ahead, uh, Brother Southman, which is here somewhere, to tape the message this morning so that I'd be able to get to hear it. And we drove last night through the storm <laughs> trying to make it, but we missed it. And um, we got so tired, just had to stop at Little Rock about between 12 and 1 o'clock and sleep a while. I overslept this morning. So I was kind of tired. We've been pretty busy and getting ready now for overseas and so forth. So we uh, was just a little tired. And, but I um, know I will enjoy hearing this patriarch's message on that time. <clears throat> One time in, up in Canada, I was privileged to hear Brother Moore read the story. Uh, and I've always wondered where that book went. Uh, I wanted to read that about the heartaches and cries of those people in the early outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I believe one of them lost a little child or something, had to, didn't even have a casket to put it in, had to go saw some boards and make a casket. And oh my, how it was rejected by the people, but yet with an undying faith moved on to see the great church today that it has produced. It goes to show what faith can do. I think if a person ever is sure in their heart and have something that faith can anchor on, they should never cease, no matter how many times they're defeated, they should continue on. You know, there was a man one time who wanted to write a, thought he could write comic strips. No one would accept his, his ability. And... Finally, he began to write some little editorials for a church, and he got out in a, a little old rat-invested garage and tried to write some stories, and no one would receive them, and every newspaper turned them down, said he didn't have the ability, but yet he believed he did. And he continued on and on, and 
you begin to notice the peculiarity of a certain little mouse that was in the garage, and there's where the story of Mickey Mouse is born, and Walt Disney now, millions and millions of dollars at his company or whatever he has is worth, because he believed that there's something in him pulsating. If a man can do that by the natural, what about a man that's been pulsated by the Holy Spirit? It believes that God wants his achievements to be brought to people and will stay with the Scripture. I'm looking forward this week to a revival in my own soul. I told my wife yesterday when I'd heard some good news and I rushed over and threw my arms around her and screamed, I'm free, and went out into the room and started weeping. And I said, you know, I, I, I want God to give me a revival in myself. I said, for about five years, I've been choked down under a, a great burden that's been released now. And, and I thought, oh my, I'm going down to Brother Jackson, have all people pray for me. And I'll have a revival down in myself. I really need it. I think we all feel a whole lot that way. Sister Anna Jean, I sure appreciate that article that you wrote, especially on that little cap. I'd like to see that. <laughs> so thankful to see Sister Moore over here, knowing she's been sick for some time. And Billy told me that she taken the floor a while ago down here or something. It was a testimony of the grace of God, His healing power. And during time this week, the Lord willing, we want to have some healing services. Pray for the sick. And we intend to do that and pray for everybody who comes to be prayed for. And we're expecting God to give us another Azusa Street outpouring. And so now, I know it, you've had, I thought the revival or the meeting started yesterday, but I find out it's been going on since last Sunday, I believe. So I know you've had great speakers in here, and we're certainly grateful that the meeting has this, has come into this atmosphere tonight, it ought not to be too hard to think of something to say to such a receptive audience and, uh, and the Spirit already here. So you just walk right into it. It feels real fine to do that. And I'm grateful that I always find that here in this church, a uh, fine welcome uh, of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's people that's standing and outside and it was around and we come down they were coming down making a line going back they, no room to get in upstairs or downstairs in the balconies and things so we are we are going to try to hurry just quick as possible and tonight speak to you a while and then tomorrow morning there is a a, a session I believe in the morning and uh, I'm sure everybody wants to be here tomorrow afternoon and brother Jack's going to answer questions I said, uh, Brother Jack, what about that? He said, I, I, I got the answer, but I don't know about the question. He said, so I'm sure glad the burden's on him <laughs> to have to answer questions. Now, we're happy and always like to meet each other and talk and, and have a good time of fellowship, and that's what it is. But now, let's... Get settled now for a few moments on the sincere side of these things, knowing that we're all marching towards the end. Day by day, I was thinking of this old patriarch here, how many that worship with him in the Zeusa streets already crossed that river. Someday, some of us, if the Lord tarries, will be talking about the meetings in Shreveport at the Jubilee. We'll be crossed over many. We must remember that we must do it so it behooves us to take every precaution. We don't get to come back and try over no more. We've got to do it now. So when I come to the audience, I never try to come to please an audience. I've never been guilty of that. I come to try to please God. And sometimes I might say things and uh, uh, might pinch, hurt, but I don't mean it in that way. We need to stay with truth and what's right and to see the Holy Spirit come down and to vindicate that, that it is right. And that's what we're all seeking. 
Now, before we read a scripture, I would like if we just bow our heads again for a, a word of prayer. Our God, we are approaching thy throne tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. Just to speak the name does something to us, for it's lovely. And we're coming up now, lifting up from this little building here, going beyond the top of the building, beyond the moon stars, into thy presence and around thy great golden altar, to lay our faith and our petitions up there with our sacrifice the Lord Jesus, and we're coming in his name, knowing that he said, if you ask the Father anything in my name, I will grant it. And now we come first to confess our sins and our faults and all the wrongs. Oh, there are so many of them, Lord, that they're numerous, but we just plead for our mercy. And we would ask, Lord, that in this great time of fellowship that you would return to us in a great outpouring of thy blessings again upon thy people as we see darkness settling and the hour drawing nigh and see the churches widening away from one another and the hour that we're living in. Draw us close again, Lord, with the bonds of fellowship around the Word and around the Spirit. May there not be a person that's any ways near, inside or out of this building, but what will be benefited tonight by their coming here. May they come with open hearts, and may we who speak speak with open hearts. May we all together be committed to the Holy Spirit, that He might take us and work His will. We most humbly thank you for the message that was given a few moments ago that we feel down in our hearts that we have the promise now that, that you will visit us. And we're looking forward to that, Lord, like children that's been given a promise. Bless the word, the reading, sanctify the ears that hear and the voice that speaks, and bring those who are wandered away back to the foe, and those who are remaining in, encourage those to go on. Heal every sick person, O oh God. May there not be a feeble person in our midst tonight. What will be healed by our presence? May we realize that this, what we are speaking to and hearing it speak back to us, is not a myth, but it is the resurrection power of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who dwells among his people. We are listening to thy voice, Lord, to hear what we should do. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that. Amen. Now, I want you, if you wish to, to turn with me in the Bible to the book of, of Leviticus, the 25th chapter. I want to read the 9th and the 10th verse uh, to draw from this a context for what I wish to say. While you're turning, I want to recognize some friends in here that are uh, See tonight, brother and sister Williams from Phoenix, where a meeting comes up shortly over there with the people in Phoenix. I see also brother and sister Norman here from Tucson, right behind him. Brother and sister Evans from down in Georgia, and uh, many others that I just begin to spot around and see. The Lord bless you. In Leviticus, the 25th chapter and the 9th and 10th verse. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of the atonement shall you make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. 
And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof, and it shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man to his possession. And you shall return every man to his family. I want to take the text from return and jubilee. Now, as I understand and have been told that this is the time of 50 years ago today, I believe it is, if I did not misunderstand, that the Holy Spirit was poured out afresh in the state of Louisiana. And I have been reading some history on the Pentecostal move, how Right on a hundred years ago, it was poured out in Russia. They rejected it. You see what they got. And wherever God sends His blessings and people reject it, the place always goes into chaos. Just rots in its condition. And we are sure that the message and the power of God, which we all believe in, is such strange, so strange to the world and its way of thinking until I believe that our nation has practically done what the rest of them has done. Now, to the honor and praise of God, we are grateful for what He has given to us. And Israel, God gave Israel, which was his servant, a possession. And we want to base it like a Sunday school lesson. Now, tomorrow night I'm intending to preach on the subject of why and how to return back. And now tonight I thought I'd more or less so the people wouldn't get it, wouldn't miss it rather, fail to get it. I'd kind of teach it like a lesson of what has taken place. And to my honest and sincere belief, what it's been and what has taken place and why. And then tomorrow night, how do we come back? Now, in a type or a figure, we take Israel because it's the Jubilee time and the church was given a potion which was Christ himself. That was poured out by the Holy Spirit into each heart that would receive it and become sons of God. Now, Israel was a servant to God and he was given a possession. And this possession was not to be uh, given to anyone else. It was to be to Israel only. Palestine belonged to them. And if we had the time, or time would permit us, rather, to go back and take the birth of those patriarchs when they were born by those uh, women, and each one, when the baby was being born and the mother in labor uttered the voice of this patriarch, positionally placed him in his place in Palestine hundreds of years later. How we can put our confidence in this written Word of God, because it's so inspired that every phase of it hangs together, and it's drawing a picture for us of what God was and what God is and always will be. Now. We find that when Joshua divided the inheritance to the people, each person was placed positionally exactly the way these Hebrew mothers named those children. How they were placed in Palestine just at their place. Asher, Gad, and, and Nephilim, and each one. Judah, every one just placed in their position. What a, a wonderful picture it gets us because... It's a type of God placing in the church Himself 
every member, every stone, every place, every Christian to itself. Each one of us in our peculiar way has a place in the house of God. Like Solomon's temple, when it was cut out all over the world, but when it was brought in by to Joppa, by floated in and tucked from there by ox cart, and all these odd rocks had their place when the temple went together. And I think that God down through this time has cut out some very odd stones that we might not have understood, but they have their place exactly in the temple and the building of God. And Joshua, by inspiration, not by just mathematics, he, he by inspired by God, he lauded each one of those uh, patriarchs in their position, just exactly the way their name belongs. What a, a picture it puts before us of God in his master work. No one could have ever done it but God. There's no way of doing it. God alone. It was to be for was to be there theirs forever. It was a gift from God. God by his marvelous grace give these people this land and this position and place them in it according to his word and the birth of the people. Just perfect how it clucked right together. And I think it was a type. And now no one else could take that place that had to be for Israel alone. Just them alone was the only ones that could take this place and still it, uh, the blessings on the place. And if somehow or other, during these time, if they lost their inheritance by some means, it might have been poverty. It might have been some other way that they, they uh, lost their inheritance for their fathers. One would uh, leave it to his son. He would leave it to his son. It belonged to that tribe. It belonged to that people. Forever it was an inheritance. If I'm not misunderstanding the Scriptures wrong, I believe in the great millennium that is to come. Amen. You know what I mean. They'll take right back to that place. Well, we know Zion shall be lit up, <laughs> that great city. And then I'll have day or night there, for the, the light will hang on Zion. And I believe in the millennium those tribes will take their positions again. Now, if somehow or other the individual lost their inheritance that was given to them by God, there come a year called the Jubilee year. And that was every seven years they had a, a rest, a Sabbath. Every seven days they had a Sabbath. Every seven years they had a Sabbath. And seven Sabbaths was 49 years. And the 50th year was Jubilee. And in this Jubilee... Every man that had lost his inheritance by some means, if he was a freeborn and a true-blooded Israelite, no matter who held the possession, it had to go back to him free. He didn't have to pay a thing. He didn't have to do a thing, but just stop what he was doing and go back to his inheritance. Oh, my. He had a right to it. It was a God-given right because he, by grace, had inherited it. And it would have been given to his fathers and handed down year after year. No matter what had taken place, if he lost it, it must go free. It meant grace is way provided for each individual to return to the rightful inheritance. What a picture it gives us tonight of the church in this last day. You see what man can do, and then you see what God does. What man does is failing and will fail, has failed, and always will fail. But what God does is eternal and must forever remain. Nothing can ever take it away. 
God give it. It's his free gift and by his sovereign foresight saw it and placed it. And there's nothing can ever move it. It's there eternally. And it, Jubilee was God's manner of expressing grace to his people for restoring or be brought back to their rightful position. Now, I believe that this is the hour again of jubilee. I believe it's the time of jubilee. I believe that 50 years ago in Louisiana, this great state where the Pentecostal people are powerful and strong, I believe that God set in operation a church. And I do not say this critically. I say it sincerely that I believe that though that little minority has grown to a great, powerful tens of thousands times thousands of Pentecostal members that's associated in every form of, of government that we have and every, uh, like police and, and uh, statesmen and, and great men, even into the federal government. Some time ago, I understood that during the reign of Dwight Eisenhower that almost 40% of the employees of the government was either Pentecostal or had Pentecostal backgrounds. Think of that. Within 50 years that the church has grown from a little handful of people down on Azusa Street until one of the mightiest churches marching forward in the world today. We are grateful for that. And I'm thanking God for that. And I am so glad to be one of them. That God, to His marvelous grace, saw fit one day to bring me into them and make me a part of them. And it is by no means that I say this next thing through uh, any harm, but through zealous of the church. But the church yet has grown in numbers, and it has grown in power, it's grown in finance, but it has fallen from what it was at that day spiritually. There is the greatest thing that could have happened to them, whether they become great in finance, great in numbers, or whether they had to stay in the minority, the greatest thing they could have helped to would have been that Holy Spirit that God, by His marvelous grace, had poured out upon them to lead them and guide them. <clears throat> I believe that they have lost and, uh, a great deal of that zeal that they had, that burning fire that fell and caught their souls aflame, that went into the street corners, to the byways and to the highways, in the, not through the easy way that we travel today, but through the way of persecution, through the way of sorrow, through the way of heartache, turned down by everyone. How I would like tonight, if my good brother maybe can hear in the world beyond, but an old saint that lived here in Shreveport years ago used to sit out when I first come here and tell me, Brother Branham, you are so right. The church is losing its grip. Oh, I pray that God will help get it back again. And Brother Lyle and I, as we set out there, that Sister Moore's father, and how he told me that in the early days, back in those days when they were persecuted and turned out from everywhere, that he was in a meeting once to where they were had forbid them to worship the Lord in the Spirit. And a group of people come up and shot through the windows with pistols and rifles. And an old sister standing in the floor with her hands up in the air, praising God while the windows was being riddled with bullets from rifles. And the bullets struck the woman's dress and fell to the floor without harming her. 
We need to go back to a power of God and a something that can do the same thing today. Although in our numbers, persecution always gives strength to the church. We've had it too easy. We get slothful. We get to a place where we don't want to move on because everything's just handed to us. It takes sorrow and tears and sweat and prayer and faith and promise to move forward in the power of the Holy Spirit. That zeal and power that they had in those days has long time vanished from our assemblies. I'm afraid if the windows would be shut out tonight, people would run every way and never come back again. But, and another thing, it's too bad. You know, to think of those things happening like that, but yet it proves that the God that was in the old days is still God today. The God that was ever remains God and expects His people to, to keep their vows and their promises. But when we get everything so easy, then we just slip along and the first thing you know, we've gone out from these things, losing our inheritance. Now I'll read down here about the 25th verse along in here in this uh, uh, 20, uh, the 25th chapter rather of Leviticus that there was something that I'd like to type, not critically, but soberly, reverently, and in the fear of God who we're all in the presence of tonight. Did you notice as you read it when you go home, if you haven't, that if a man bought property inside of a walled city. Then he had one year to redeem that back if he sold it. And if he did not redeem that back, that property, if it was inside of a wall, had to stay in there. It could not go free in the Jubilee. It was bound to stay there. They were over the wall. They had never heard the Jubilee, the trumpet sounding. They sounded the trumpet, and it could not go free. And I'm so afraid that one of the things that we had in the beginning, how the old-timers preached against organizing ourselves together, we turned around and done the very thing back that our fathers fought so hard to come out of. And the wall city... I'm afraid that too many of us today, too many of our Pentecostal people has got walled into some denomination, some organization somewhere, and will never hear the sound of the Jubilee, never come again back to the, the inheritance. Now remember, the ones that was walled in never got to go free. They were bond slaves the rest of their time. The owner owned them if they put their inheritance in a city that was walled in. But if it was outside little bitty cities that wasn't walled in, then it was considered like the plains, that it could go free in the Jubilee. I do not wish to criticize, but I only wish to state what is truth, what is actually scriptural truth. Now, we find that so many of us in these last days in our organization of Pentecost, that we have come in and organized ourselves and rejected the leadership of the Holy Spirit by the wisdom of some groups of people. And instead of having fellowship one with another, it's divided us and separated us into several different organizations of people. And in doing so, it has broke up our inheritance. Now, these walls inside, if we ever get walled into a place where we can't accept the Word and the Holy Spirit and have to take the, the creeds and so forth of a church instead of the power of the Holy Spirit, the Jubilee will never mean nothing to that person. No matter how much you can say, Mother left to your inheritance. Daddy did that. But you sold out. 
and walled up and come into a creed and accepted this dogma that was injected into your fellowship instead of being free in the Christ and letting the Holy Spirit lead us. Along back in the age when the early church was getting itself together, immediately they had to go to organizing. And when they did because they was afraid that somebody else, would, a leader, would get a little group, they had issues that came in. And then they had to organize these issues. If they had just left it alone, let the Holy Spirit weed out and bring out and lead in and put in, the church would have been farther advanced than it is now in spiritual <clears throat> power. Yes. Now, a man and his family could go back to their original inheritance if they could hear the jubilee uh, trumpet sound and know that what it meant to them. Now, if they heard the priest sound the trumpet, the minister, the trumpet is the gospel. And when they hear it, and they know what it means, and they know that that's their inheritance, no matter where they'd lost, how far they went back, whatever they had to do, they had the privilege to come and receive again their inheritance. The whole family could come and receive their inheritance. So is it tonight that men and women here of Louisiana that knows the things that we do know and have heard from our brother and different ones of our Pentecostal experience of years ago and find that we have walled off, we haven't walled ourselves away from it so far that we got to hear what somebody says instead of what thus saith the Lord is and can hear what the Word of God's got to say about it. Now is the hour of jubilee. Come back to your original inheritance to a real Holy Ghost again. Remember, he could go free. Didn't have to pay nothing. Didn't have to do nothing. Just get up and go. That's all he had to do. Go back. If he knew the sound of the trumpet. But he had to know the sound of the trumpet. See, for they were sons of God. We, Jesus said in St. John 8.35 that the Son abides forever in the house. Now, a servant does not abide. A servant does not abide. Remember, he is a son, not a servant. If he's a son, he is born a son. If he's a servant, he is joined or bought. Oh, there is no such a thing as joining the church. There's no word for it in the Bible. You cannot join the church. The church is the mythical body of Jesus Christ that you got to be born into it by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's no such a thing as joining a church. In Revelation is the 17th chapter. If you'll read in the diglot, the uh, emphatic diglot of the Original Vatican manuscript. You'll find there in Revelation 17 in the King James Verse it says, And she was full of names of blasphemy, the prostitute church, a daughter. She had daughters. Many daughters were associated with her. She was a prostitute. The first organized religion ever was. Was organized at Nicaea, Rome. At the Nicaea. At the Nicaea Council. Then she became an organization, a universal Christian church of an organization. She had daughters. And you see there that King James put it, she had names of blasphemy. But in the original Diglot, it said she was full of blasphemous names. What a difference from names of blasphemy to blasphemous names. That means to me, I don't know uh, if I'm wrong, God forgive me, but it means churches that has took on the names of Christianity that live like the world and act like the world and do the things of the world and has brought a disgrace upon the true church of the living God. And they join those. You might join the Methodist Lodge, Presbyterian Lodge, or the Pentecostal Lodge, but you cannot join the church. You must be born into the church by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is true. Now we see where we're getting to. All right. 
Remember, sons abide. They are forever in there. They are brought in there by predestination. Ephesians 1, 5. Predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. They are sons that are born into the church of God and they ever remain there because they're born into it. Right. A servant. Now remember, a servant gets his reward or his wages, but he was never to be free in the Jubilee. No, sir. A servant was not free in the Jubilee that was not born an Israelite. He had to be born in order to be free in the Jubilee. He got his wages. And many people get their rewards. Jesus said about the hypocrites, that they have their rewards. But you're different. Yes, that's what Jesus is saying in John 8 about the Jews. They said, we're free. He said, the servant does not abide in the house. But when he gave them birth, they was no longer servants, they were sons. And joint heirs with him in the kingdom. That's the way the church is. It's joint heirs with Christ in the kingdom. Heirs of all things to God through him. Now, we find that the church moved off in the same direction that his forefathers moved in. The, the first organizations of churches. It's been that way down through the ages. But they are never, never, the servants will not be free. They will not hear the word. They will not believe the word. The servants, they heard the trumpet sound, that priest riding through the land, sounding this trumpet, that every man was free, sounded out throughout liberty all out the lands. And every man that was born a Jew, no, he could go back to his inheritance. I don't care how far he was sold, what happened, he could go back. Because he was a born in the house. He was in his father's house born. But the servant didn't know what he was doing. Oh my. Both of them were working for the same master. Sold under sin. Many a Pentecostal tonight sold the same way. Oh brother, return. Go back to your original inheritance. All of you. Turn and go back. It's time to go back. The heathen. Now, the heathen slave could not do that. He didn't know nothing about it. And after all, a heathen means an unbeliever. An unbeliever in the Word. Many of them will take dogmas and rituals and creeds of the church instead of listening to the real Word. And when the real Word sounds itself out, they don't know what you're talking about. They want to call you a holy roller. They want to call you like they did the forefathers 50 years ago in Louisiana. Crazy. Like it was back in the days of Paul. In the way of heresy, that's the way I worship the God of our fathers. See, the heathen don't know nothing about it. Though he professes to be something, but yet a heathen is an unbeliever. Unbeliever in God's Word. That makes him a heathen. It was only for the elected, God's chosen. That's the way it is today. Not him that runs or him that willeth. It's God that has mercy. It's God that does it. God by His grace. Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And all the Father has given me will come to me. It's God's grace that He chose the church before the foundation of the world. That church will hear the Word of God. They'll turn every creed down. They'll turn every organization, every denomination that's contrary down and they'll serve God by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. They certainly know the trumpet sound. My sheep hear my voice. What are you talking about? The Word. You say that's God's voice? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word is with God and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. My sheep hear that. They know it. A stranger they will not follow. They don't hear these creeds. They don't hear these dogmas. And these things have been injected to make an organization instead of a body. A body has thou prepared me, said God. Acts, or Hebrews. A body has thou prepared me. A sacrifice and offers thou wouldest not. But a body has thou prepared me. A body of believers. A body that's been born before it can be a body of human beings. Before I can act as a human. Before I can walk like a human. 
Before I can talk like a human, I have to be born a human. How would a knot on the tree know how I acted? How could he ever say, I don't act like that? The only way he could be that is be born like me. That's why organizations today have drawn people away. Because it went after a creed. But in order to be a son of God, you've got to be born of the Spirit of God. Then you become Christ-like and do the works of Christ. Then you're not funny to them people. A human acting like a human is not funny. And a Christian acting like a Christian. Born to the same Spirit. You see the Pentecostal group at the beginning? That same Pentecostal group acts the same way if it's born to the same Spirit. Because it's born. That's why today that people doesn't understand the church. And the church is beginning to grow cold and formal, getting after creeds and things, and leaving off the pulling of the Holy Spirit. All right. Others doesn't know the sound of the trumpet. The bond slave is bond, the Bible said here, from generation to generation. Everyone that come into that city and bought property, he was bound. He could not redeem his property in the Jubilee. It did not go out free. And he could not redeem it. It remained the one that bought it from generation to generation. That's what the scripture says here. He must remain in that city with his property. Well, that's where his inheritance was. Was in the city. He wasn't free to go back because he'd sold out. Now, we say from generation to generation. I asked a man not long ago, one time, Dr. Bosworth. I guess you remember Brother Bosworth. He said, I asked a girl one night in Toronto, Canada, are you a Christian? She said, I'll have you to understand I burn a candle every night. <laughs> like, see, that's all she knows about Christianity. I asked a woman one time, was she a Christian? She said, I'm an American. I'll give you to understand. I said, that's not nothing to do with it. I was going to pray for a woman one time, and a lady said, pull the curtain there. I said, well, I was just going to offer prayer. She said, pull that curtain. I said, all right. Aren't you a Christian? She said, we're a Methodist. I said, that testifies fine that you're not. See? 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 See, if you say Methodist, that's just a blasphemous name. If you say Baptist, that's just a blasphemous name. We can say amen to that, but brother, let me ask you something. What about Pentecost? If it's not a born-again experience, it's still a blasphemous name. Pattern after the beginning. You're correct. That's right. See, they don't know one another. They don't know fellowship. All they know is their creed. They're just settled down like some kind of a lodge, like a lodge. Our lodges is all right if you want to belong to them, but don't associate it with the church. The church is a born-again bunch of believers. That's in Christ by the Holy Ghost, led by the Spirit of God. They're not of the world. They're out of the world. They're different from the world. That's what makes them what they are. Their life is dead. They're hidden in Christ. And, they're dead in Christ and hidden, by, sealed by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> they're away from the things of the world. The bond slave, from generation to generation. One woman said, well, I'm a Lutheran. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Pardon me. A Lutheran. My mother was a Lutheran. My grandfather was a Lutheran. All right? Bond slave from one to the other. Hand it right on down. Just remain that way. You never go free in the Jubilee. You can preach the Word. You can see the Holy Ghost heal the sick, open the eyes of the blind, speak in tongues, interpret it exactly what the Bible says, but you don't know the sound of the trumpet. Right! That's the truth. They don't know the sound of the trumpet. They've sold out. They've put their inheritance back totter in some walled-in city. Our Pentecostal church has done the same thing. That's, put it right back into a box, robed in city and they don't hear the Word of God. They say if they don't come this way, don't come to our bunch, well then it's not the right thing. Your name's not on our books, you can't go in the rapture. Your name's on the Lamb's book of life. And it was put there before the foundation of the world. And there's nothing to rub it out. My sheep know my voice. A stranger they'll not follow. Yes, sir. If the rich servant, a man come in and become a servant and got rich, and he bought a brother, now that brother could be redeemed by a kinsman. A kinsman could come get him in the year of Jubilee and could redeem him. What a beautiful Christ here we have, a, a beautiful picture rather of Christ. How that a, a pilgrim out there in a bond sold out to the rich cities out there, sold out into the richest of organization. But a kinsman brother who knows he's out there some night put his Bible under his arm and go after him. A kinsman because he's got the same spirit. He's born in the same family. 
go call him out of that group. He's a kinsman redeemer. How that the picture was portrayed wonderful in the book of Ruth. Boaz, when he taken the place of a kinsman redeemer, representing Christ. The church now is like Israel. The church is like Israel when it come up out of Egypt. When Israel was down there in Egypt, God, by His marvelous grace, without any organization or anything else, He called Israel to His help. He called them to their inheritance. He, grace, furnished them a prophet. Grace, give them a pillar of fire. Grace, give them a lamb, sacrificial lamb. Grace, give them power. Grace, give them deliverance. Grace, give them victory. Grace, give them all these things. And they danced in the Spirit and shouted and praised God about it. And little did they know when they were dancing on the banks of the Jordan or the Dead Sea that they were 40 years away from the land. It was only about five days away. But they made their rational mistake in Exodus, the 19th chapter, where they accepted law instead of grace. Where they turned down God's way to have a way for themselves. Give us something to do. That's been man's idea all along. Now remember, it's been man's idea. That's the nature of man. Adam expressed that in the Garden of Eden. When he was lost, instead of going back to God for grace, he tried to make himself an apron. And ever since then, he's tried to have something to do with redemption. When redemption is a free offer of grace by God. God alone. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. God saved you. No way at all you can do, but man wants something to do into it. They accepted today and as 50 years ago when your mothers and fathers, your Pentecostal people tonight, when them old timers are this and sitting on the pulpit here tonight, shouted and praised God. They come out of them organizations. While you speak organization to them, they'd laugh in your face. They were free. Yes, sir. They shouted and praised God. They spoke in tongues. They had signs and wonders and miracles. The Holy Ghost came down. They seen the literal form of Christ. They done great signs and wonders. They suffered. They bled. They went under persecution, bitter, and everything for that cause. And now, what did they do? The same thing Israel did. They made their rational mistake too. They wanted to organize. And what did it do to Israel? What did it do to Israel? It they, they wouldn't accept the leadership of the Holy Spirit. They wouldn't accept the leadership of Moses. They tried to even raise up Korah and Dathan and so forth to, to, to lead them. They didn't want the leadership that God had provided for them. And today we don't want the leadership, or the church don't, that God has provided. They try to think of some other way. They go to seminaries, educate their man, come back out with a theological experience. Oh, I'd rather have a man preaching to me that don't know his ABCs and never was in a, a theological seminary and have an experience out you know, on the broomside sage hill somewhere behind a stump and God fill him with the Holy Ghost? Yeah. Certainly. Let him be led by the Spirit. God will make everything move right in direction towards him. He's like a magnet. Can't hide him. Like a house on fire in a high wind. You can't put him out. He'll burn right on. He's burning for Christ. You can't do nothing about it. Yes. What did they do? Oh, they did the same thing that Israel did. Oh, they had victory. They shouted. They danced. They spoke in tongues at Pentecost down here in Louisiana 50 years ago. But as Israel wanted something to do themselves, so did the Pentecostal church. They organized the assemblies of God. Then after that come the other. I believe called it united or something. Then on come another, and then another, and then another, and then another. So look where it's at today. You know what you've done? The same thing Israel did. When they rejected God's provided plan for them, they began to wonder. That's what the church has done today. Wondering about and taking in everything into their denomination. Tobacco smokers and unholy people that married four or five times and everything else. Let them preach and take a hillbilly singer out down around the uh, rat house out there one night. And let him play on the platform the next night. What's well, a disgrace to the church of the living God? Certainly. What did they do? It's brought blasphemous names. Throw Pentecost. The very name it should be holy. It's thrown it into a spot because they say he's Pentecostal. She's Pentecostal. They're Pentecostal. Look the way they do an act. Right. Blasphemous names. Sure, that's the truth. 
Yes, sir. They made a rational mistake when they did that. And they wandered for 40 years. That's exactly what they done. They wandered for 40 years. When they wasn't over five days from the promised land. It's about 40 miles from the Red Sea to where they crossed Jordan. About 40 miles. They could have walked in three or four days and been into the promised land. But they made their own choice. And the church would have been a church tonight, glorious without spot or wrinkle, if the fathers would accept it and stayed with the Holy Spirit that God had brought about them organizations, but they went right back into it like a dog to its vomit and a hog to its water. They went right back again into that. And now we've wandered another 50 years, wandering in the wilderness. But there come a time when God said, you've been on this mountain long enough. Come on, we're going over. <laughs> May it be Louisiana's experience now in this jubilee. May it be an experience again that God the Holy Spirit will speak to the people of this generation, their sons, as he did back there when the old fighters had died out. That fought and said, do you go to do this, I'll do this. Now. You baptize in the name of Jesus, we'll have nothing to do with you. And you do this, we'll have that and everything. The old fighters are dead. Right. It's time to rise, ye sons of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, and rise to a place where you can return in this jubilee and hear the sound of the trumpet of the gospel of the word of God. Ye are brethren. You are not denominated. You are brethren because you can't be denominated. You are born sons of God. If the slaves want to stay in the walled city, let them stay. But you are free. You are free. Let's go back. Let's go back to our inheritance. Let's go back to the beginning. Back to their, led by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's where they made a mistake. One time again, Israel did that. It's just a thing that people does. One time, Israel looked around. After they had their inheritance divided to them, they wanted to be like the rest of the world. They desired a king. The old prophet. Prophet's always been God's way of telling people. The word of the Lord came to the prophets. It's a prophet who told him the truth. And Samuel stood up and he said, Have I ever taken your money? Or have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? They said, That is true. You never took our money. You've never taken our living. You've never begged us for things. And you've never told us nothing in the name of the Lord but what was the truth. He said, Then stay away from them things out there. Get a king over you. God, you're a king. And it displeased God. And Samuel wept before the Lord. And the Lord said, They haven't rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me. You're just an instrument I'm working to. Let them have it. That's exactly what they got. And we find the sorrow that followed it. God is their king. God is our king. The Holy Spirit is our leader. God give us a Holy Ghost. Let's say by it. The Bible of direction to see where it is the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost can't promise something here tonight over here. It's got to keep exactly what it said to remain God. It's got to stay Holy Spirit. It's got to be the same. Yes, they wanted to displease Samuel. When Samuel had the word of the Lord and told him, Israel shouted and danced. Sure, they had a great time. But they found out they wandered for 40 years. Now, and our wondering, did you ever think what they did out there in the wilderness? Did you ever think of what Israel done? God blessed them. Sure they did. They had their gardens or crops. They married their wives. They raised their children. God blessed them. And he's blessed the Pentecostal move. He's sure. But remember, that wasn't what God sent them out to to live in that wilderness. They were just to pass through the wilderness. They were on the road to the promised land. The church was to go on to the full promise. The church tonight should be in sure splendor of glory. She should be waiting for the coming of the Lord. Instead of that, she's scattered everywhere, wondering which is right. Is this right? Is that right? I'll join this and over here and down that. Oh, return. Get away from those things. Now, what has it done for us? It done that for them. It made them remain in the wilderness. It's brought us right back into the same vomit that we come out of. 
we organize ourselves and put us right back in the same mess that we come out of. Can't you understand that God never had an organization, never did ordain one and never spoke one, but always against it. God wants to lead man. Man just can't lead themselves. They say, we're in the multitude of counsel. That proved a great fake one time when Jehoshaphat went out to meet Ahab. And they said, we got, we us consult the Lord. It sounds very scriptural. It said, there's Ramoth Gilead. It belongs to us. God gave it to us. Hebrew children aren't beating that wheat up there, but instead the enemy's eating it. Don't you think we should go up? And Jehoshaphat said, a good man in wrong company. That's the way the Pentecostal groups are tonight. Fine people, Methodist, Baptist, and so forth. Pentecost is not an organization. Pentecost is an experience. Many good people got in the wrong company, listened to those dogmas and rejected the word. Exactly. Notice, Jehoshaphat said, should not we consult the Lord? He said, sure. Excuse me. Oh, of course, I ought to know that. I got 400 fine Hebrew prophets down here. I'll go down and get them. So he went down the all prophesied. Zedekiah got him two horns. He said, go on up. Sure. Sound logical? They said, God gave us the land. That's ours. But there's something goes with it. You must obey God to stay in that land. That's the way it is tonight, Pentecost. You disobey God when you organize and separate yourself, seemingly not having the faith. You may be Pentecostal, but you're by name, but you got to be Pentecostal under conditions. That's the life of Christ. The Word of God can flow through you and manifest itself and prove it to be God and God working through you. The life of Christ in you. Now, we know that, see what this, he said, well, the, all of them said, go up, the Lord's with you. Go up and push him back off the land, it belongs to us. And you know, that didn't sound just right to Jehoshaphat, he's a spiritual man. He said, isn't there one more that we could consult? Well, I'll consult one where here's the whole organization out, all the bishops and presbyters and all. They're all standing out here. Why well, get any more? He said, but surely there's one more. He said, yeah, I got one that I could consult, but I hate him. Yeah. Uh, well, sure. Certainly you hated him. He was a real prophet. He said he's Emlyn, the son of Micah. The organization put him out a long time ago. They won't have any fellowship with him, so let's hear him. <laughs> well, I said, I hate him. He said, let the king not say so, but let's hear what he's got to say. Then some of the presbyters run over and told him, said, all the bishops and everybody said this and this, you must say the same thing. He said, I'll just say what God puts in my mouth. Amen. Oh, we ought to have Brother Zepp here now to sing amen, of course, for it. Yes, sir. Say what God puts in your mouth. You'll never say nothing but his word. A prophet is a teller forth the same as a fourth teller. True. So he said, I'll say what God says. And then he checked his vision. Let me have tonight and see what the Lord says. Next morning he come out and had, thus saith the Lord. Why? He checked it. He knew that, that real prophet before him, who the word of the Lord came to, had to be right. He cursed Ahab. Told the dogs would lick his blood and Jesse Bella be strode over the fields and so forth. He knew nothing good could come out of that thing was a hypocrite. I'll tell you that God will never bless the church as long as she organizes herself and sets herself to one side, which God has proved down through the age he's cursed. Show me one group of people where God raised up a revival down through the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Camelite, whatever it might be when he raised up a group of people and started a revival when they organized, they died and never come back. How can God bless what he's cursed? Oh, return, Louisiana. The year of Jubilee's on. Return to your own. Return to your inheritance. Certainly. Notice. And he went up there on the hill and he lost his life. It's exactly because notice that Micah set his prophecy and noted his vision compared exactly with the word of the Lord. Certainly. What has it done to us? It's done the same thing. We took multitude of counsel for safety. That goes in another place of Scripture. I can say Judas went and hung himself and you go do likewise. But it don't, don't apply in the Scripture right. You've got to make it say just exactly what it says. There's no private interpretation. Read it just the way it reads. That's the way it's got to be. And then you always come back to it and God's got to honor it. He watches over His Word to fulfill His promises. What has it done to us? It weakened our faith, first thing. I got a list of things. Go down here, ten pages. What it's done to us? I'll skip part of them. <laughs> the first thing it weakened our faith because it separated us. And we've seen another brother over in another organization speaking in tongues and receive the Holy Ghost and doing the same things we did, and yet we were taught that he is no hypocrite because he didn't believe in our belief. 
We are not divided, all one body, we. One hope and doctrine, the Bible, one in charity. It weakened our faith, paralyzed us. Yes, sir. What did it do? It made chickens out of eagles. <laughs> Earthbound birds out of heavenly ones. <laughs> Well, a chicken is a bird, all right, but he's earthbound. He keeps his nest down here wherever weasel he come, come around, kill his eggs and get his little ones and things. But not an eagle. He builds it so high, he utters that nothing can touch him. God likens his heritage to eagles, you know. That's right. And we've got a bunch of Pentecostal chickens, not eagles. What made it? We give them chicken feed. <laughs> That's what did it. Some kind of a creed or denomination, not the word of the living God. We switched it and turned it and made what we wanted to make out of it to make an organization. Added dogmas exactly like the Roman church did. Same thing, no wonder she was a mother of harlots. Yes, sir. They give them chicken feed, denominational creed. And they've lived on that. That's all they know. They're earthbound. They don't know how to raise their feet and rise up in the presence of God and claim victory. They don't know how to shout the praises of God. They don't know how to accept divine healing. You can talk to them. They bray like a mule. They know nothing about it. I'm not, if I'm, just forgive me if I said something wrong. I didn't mean to say anything wrong. I mean to make a point that people can talk about divine healing, they turn their back. Oh, even our Pentecostal groups are denying it. Did you know the Roman Catholic Church was first the Pentecostal Church? 2,000 years is borrowed that. Let this Pentecostal organization run the way it's in, and 100 years from now it'll be worse than the Roman Church. That's what adding creeds and dogmas does. You make chickens instead of eagles. God, God's Jehovah eagle. All these little ones are eaglets. Brother, they know how to take a ride up there in the blue above all this kind of quick whack down here that goes on. They don't want none of your barnyard assemblies. <laughs> they fly up in the heavens where the stars are. Breathe a fresh air of purity. Yes, sir. Oh, yes. They've modernized our assemblies. That's what they've done. And another thing they've done, they've brought immorality to our women. Exactly. Our man, our brothers, put them in denominations and say, if you don't, if we give that, take your card away from you, your fellowship card, well, you'll never be able to preach nobody else because we'll blackmail you, we'll blackball you, and they're afraid that makes a chicken out of him. Brother, shake loose. Come back to the Jubilee. You're an eagle. Let nobody tell you you're a buzzard or a chicken, excuse me. Uh, you're, well, a buzzard too, you know, vulture. Yes, sir. You're an eagle. Yes, sir. You don't care for your old dead creeds and denominations. Let's come back. We're eagles. We fly in the heavenlies. Amen. An eagle can go where no other bird can think of going. <laughs> they try to follow him and disintegrate. He's a special built bird. <laughs> yes, indeed. I tell you, a man is born of the Spirit of God as a special built man or woman. Hallelujah. They're born with the Spirit in them and knows how to act and to do and to be a son of God. Amen. True. You know that's the truth. Yes, sir. We don't have to have it. Our women, it used to be a shame for our women to cut their hair. They're doing it. It used to be wrong for women to wear makeup. They do it. Pentecostals. I went here not long ago to one of our famous Pentecostal churches. They know what was coming. So I just go preach the word. And I've been preaching. Every one of them got up and went out almost. They didn't have hardly enough to have a Sunday school. There went bobbed haired women and Rickies and Elvis and all of them taken off one way and this way, that way. And with Sunday school teachers, I said, that bunch of chickens. <laughs> they can't stand good fresh meat. That's right. We need a Holy Ghost. Eagles eat eagles food. Eagles don't live off of creeds. They live off of the Holy Ghost. They live off of Christ. God's real eagles. There had to be born special. She can say, I'm a bird too. I know you're a bird. <laughs> That's right. But not an eagle. They don't hear it. They can't stand it. They can't it fill up. They just can't take it. Why? They can't take it. They don't know nothing about it. Solemnized our assemblies, paralyzed them. Our assemblies has been paralyzed by modernism. We've got great big fine churches, great big fine organizations, great big fine doctors of divinity. I ever had a respect for a little woman one time was Aunt Mrs. McPherson, Ralph McPherson's wife, a lovely little Christian. And I was sitting talking at a breakfast with a, one of the Christian businessmen. 
And we were sitting there talking, having, oh, it was a dinner it was. And um, so Brother Teeford said to me, he said, Brother Branham, I wonder why you haven't come out to see us a long time ago. And Sister McPherson, she come out of an old-fashioned Pentecostal home. Her father and mother were one of the old pioneers of Pentecost. I said, well, you got to talk about another brother who established a big church and taken from her all they had from the temple. And all they had done like this. I said, well, that's a very poor compliment to the church here. If they're going over there to build a million-dollar church and got one already built here. I said, hungry children eat out of a garbage can. They're hungry. No. So, and when we got to talking about it, Sister McPherson raised up and she said, Roth, that's true. She said, what do we got here but a million dollar white elephant? I said, if you get back to that gospel that Mrs. McPherson stood for, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the power of God, instead of Dr. Ph.D., LLD, all that kind of schooling here. Yes. We need a return to Pentecost. Amen. Back to the gospel. Back to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Yes, sir. Go out there and see them women preachers, short cut hair, all kinds. You know how they do. You know what it does? I went the other day up here in a country and I never seen, I seen a woman over here in Los Angeles. I went up to pray for her. I thought she had leprosy. But I'd seen leprosy. It didn't look like that. Green under the eyes and everything like that. I, well, I never, I started walking up and say, lady, I'm a missionary. I've seen leprosy. I've seen plaguery. I've seen everything. I've never seen anything like that. I'm a minister. Would you let me pray for you? Here come another. And I looked this like her. And I thought, wait a minute. What was it? What's well, a shame? Maybe a nice looking woman. But you know, you're not supposed to look like a freak. That's some prehistoric something. Something off of somewhere they call Myers. You're a born again saint of God. Say the way God made you. Many of them Pentecostal women. When a woman does that false on the outside, the outside only expresses what's on the inside. It's false on the inside. She's got a false denomination she's holding to instead of Christ ought to fill her life with the power of His resurrection. Instead of that, she's tucked some man-made creed. The outside always expresses what's on the inside. The tree's knowing about the fruit it bears. Oh, my. I know you might think I'm critical, but I'm not critical I'm just trying to tell you what's true. <laughs> Look what it's got our churches today. Look where we're at. Well, our mothers wouldn't have thought of such a thing. Our brothers wouldn't have thought of such a thing as an organization. Well, you went back there in his early days and said something about that, that laughed in your face. We said, we come out of that vomit. We come out of that water. God called us out. We don't want to go back like Israel for the flesh pots again of Egypt. God brought us out of it. We've been wanting to go back. We went back and see what we got. The same thing they are. Pop can't call Kittle black. <laughs> That's right. Six to one and a half a dozen of the other. Creeds and things just separate us. But brother, oh, I could hold on this a long time. But let's not do it. Let me give you one good news. This is the year of Jubilee. If you've got mixed up in that kind of stuff, let's return. We got an inheritance. The fathers of Pentecost Fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Let's not walk this flower bed of ease by joining some organization, settling down and saying, bless God, I'm Pentecost. Let's get the experience. Let's go back to God. Let's go back to the eagle food. Let's go back to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the Word of God. Let's go back to the fast and pray. Oh, the church forgot the street meetings long ago. The church forgot its long nights of prayer. Why, well, they can't pray 15 minutes no more. Oh, my, when it does, it's some of the formal thing. Half of them fall asleep. Why, it's a, it's a disgrace. Chickens trying to eat eagle food. You can't do it. Won't digest. Try it. You're not built for it. You're not built for the rugged part. You've got to be built rugged. The only way you never get that is to be born again and change your way and come back. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's time to return. Return to what, Brother Branham? Return back to the organization I come out of? No. Return back to your inheritance. The inheritance that our Father left us. How did he, what kind of inheritance did he leave? Wait ye in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. That's the inheritance. Not go join this one and go join that one, go join this one. Wait till the power comes from on high. How long until? 
One day, two days, wait until. Don't take some little emotion, some little flusteration. Wait there until you're dead and buried and born again anew in Christ Jesus. And every pulsation of your life beats out Jesus Christ. So you can see the life of Christ reflected right in your, your living way you go. Yes, sir. So you can find that power like they had back there in the beginning. Back to a Pentecostal inheritance. Yes, sir. That's your possession. Denomination is not your possession. Pentecost is your possession. Not a Pentecostal organization. Your fathers come out of such a thing. The Pentecostal experience is your possession. Examine ourselves. The sounding of the trumpet. What kind of a trumpet? The Word. God's trumpet. The Holy Ghost in the Word. Oh, the poet really expressed it right. When he said, nations are breaking, Israel's awakening, the signs that the prophets foretold, the Gentile days numbered with horrors encumbered, return, O dispersed, to your own. The day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamps trimmed and clear. Today we have preachers, ethical, educated, fine scholars turned out to stand up and never move, never muss up a hair, never sweat a drop, and just stand there and speak and all give the articles of the church and everything just so pretty for 15 minutes while you're sleeping. Go on back home and you call yourself Pentecostal. <laughs> Brother, we need an old rugged backwoods preacher that'll come out with a pair of overhauls on and hit the pulpit. Hallelujah! Anointed with the power of God. He won't preach five minutes till the Spirit will take the church that's gone the rest of the night. <laughs> Up into the heavenlies. It's eagles. They won't peck around on barnyard stuff. They go on up into the heavenlies for their food. <laughs> the sounding of the trumpet. Yes, sir. Return dispersed. But if you sold your inheritance, if you sold out and done these things, what am I saying? Return back. If you joined up with some cult that tries to keep you away from fellowship with other brethren, leave the thing. Amen. This is Jubilee. Amen. 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 I feel religious. <laughs> return, return. This is Jubilee. Don't let it pass by. Remember, don't let it pass by. If you've sold out, if you've went out in the world, if you've sinned, you know you once had the experience, you went and joined up where you can't fellowship with the rest of them. You've done all these things. I don't care what you've done. If you're a son, you have a right to return now because it's jubilee. It's jubilee time. But if you settle back into a wall somewhere, put your name down and anchored, got all chickenized, there isn't going to be much happening to you because you'll never hear it. You walk out and say, well, I guess it was all right. I've heard that before. See? Go home, sleep it off. <laughs> yep, the next morning. But conviction you don't sleep off. The Word of God you can't shake off. If you're an eagle, you've caught something. This sounds sacrilegious, and I hope it don't mean it that way to you, but I, I don't mean it myself. Like the farmer set the hen. He had, didn't have, well, he had enough eggs to set her. Like in one, he put an eagle egg under it. And that little eagle at born is the funniest looking thing amongst them chickens you've ever seen. He's an odd bird, all right. So he, the old hen would cluck and she'd eat nearly anything. And that little fella, that wasn't a diet for him. He just, he just couldn't stand it. And you hear that cluck in the hen. What does that mean? We got pie supper, socials, dances, <laughs> bunko. See? He's an eagle. He just couldn't understand that stuff. One day, the old man, he hunting for him. Must have been the year of Jubilee for the little fella. <laughs> the old mother come over and she screamed. He looked up. So that sounds right. <laughs> he heard something. She said, son, you're not a chicken. You're an eagle. <laughs> come out of it. <laughs> the mama, how do I get out? She said, just flap your wings. That's your God-given deliverance. You're born an eagle. You've got an inheritance. Come on up higher. Get out of that stuff. Return back. He made four or five flops, and when he did, he sat right down on a post in the yard, right in the middle of Pentecostal organization. She said, son, you'll have to jump higher than that. I can't get you. <laughs> Next jump, he lit on his mammy's wings and went on into the heavenlies. That's the call of the day, brother. Return back. You're not chickens. 
your eagles return back. Yes, sir. Now we know that it's true. Now the trumpets are blowing. It's the sound, and this is the 50th year. You heard this old patriarch this morning and through these messages what it was. I'm telling you tonight that the promise is now. It's returned back. Paul said in Acts, I know in 1 Corinthians 14, 8, if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who can prepare himself? We got great men crossing the world today. All the churches are organizing together like a big political machine. People come out like some great regime coming to it. And the first thing you know, the Methodist takes theirs and goes that way. And the Baptist takes theirs and goes that way. And one don't know what the other is doing. Mercy goodness, that's not it. The trumpet gives an uncertain sound. Come join this creed. Come join that creed. And the Bible saying something else. Yes, sir. If the trumpet don't give a certain sound, you can't, don't know what to prepare yourself for. But when you see the trumpet of God sounding the word of God and God vindicating it with signs and wonders as he said he would do. That's right. If the trumpet gives an uncertain sound, the chief captain won't vindicate the call. Oh, brother, that was a stomach full. The chief captain won't vindicate the call. For he said in Mark 16, all the world in these signs shall follow them that believe. That's the chief captain. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the call. The captain said, I've vindicated him by this. He said also in John 14, 12, the chief captain said, He that believeth on me, not him. It says he believes. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Amen. Amen. That's the certain sound. He said to those Jews, said, Why, you're a man making yourself God. He said, If I do not the works of my Father, then believe me not. <laughs> Amen. Let's have it, Brother Church. Right. These signs shall follow them that believe. Up and down through Louisiana in a buggy and old T model force with cars wrapped on with bailing wire, when your father's preaching that against these dogmas that you've added to it, come out of it. Return. Come back. Repent. Return back to where you come from. This is Jubilee year. These signs shall follow them that believe. Yes, sir. Oh, let me say this. This tape, I know. You rich lady or see a church. Said, I have need of nothing. You know the Bible said you'd be that way. Said, you're lukewarm. Oh, you say, we shout and praise God. Oh, yes, Israel did the same and made such an awful mistake. And that ain't it. I mean that burning zeal of God. Nothing can stop it. Look at that Hebrews 11 there. Or just one nod of them patriarchs from God. They subdued kingdoms, rock rocks, and just stopped the uh, lion's mouth and escaped the fire. And the things that they've done through faith were just one nod from God. The day God can stand a preacher and hammer that word as hard as he can, and we go to sleep. Get up and walk out. No wonder you're walled in the churches. I'm, I know this is taped. It's going lots of places, you see. This go all over the world. Because we have a tape sale completely around the world. Goes to missionary in foreign fields. I mean, everyone, yes, sir, return. This is the time to return while the calls are coming. Yes, sir. These signs shall follow sons, not slaves. Not bondsmen, not servants, but sons. These signs shall follow believers. And no man can call Jesus Christ only by the Holy Ghost. That's right. You might say you do, but the Holy Ghost has to vindicate it and prove it. Yes, sir. Oh, rich lady, I see it. With a church on the outside. Christ on the outside of the church, rather knocking, trying to get in. Said, I'm rich and don't have need of nothing. Sure, you come right up with the Methodists and Baptists. Overrun them in numbers. But where is that power of God that fell 50 years ago? Where is that zeal that burned in the hearts of them people that walked the railroad tracks and picked up corn and crushed it out there to bring the gospel? We make them turn over in their graves. We bring disgrace to our fathers and mothers that fought to win the prize. And here we luxury around to denominational. Have I said enough? <laughs> to let you understand its return. God pulled his elected church out of them denominations 50 years ago. God pulled that remnant out. This is Jubilee. He's calling again. 
Return! Jubilee! Fifty years ago, God pulled him from it. And tonight he's trying to do it again. We'll continue tomorrow night. It's quarter after. Let's bow our heads. Nations are breaking. Christ is everywhere. Israel's awakening. She's her own nation. Got her own money, her own army. She's in the United Nations. The signs that the Bible foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors encumbered atomic bombs and everything. Oh, return, oh, disperse to your home. This is the year of Jubilee. The day of redemption is near. Man's hearts are failing for fear. Be filled with the Spirit, your lamps trimmed and clear. Look up, your redemption is near. Return, return. The Holy Spirit cries, return. I can think of when Jesus looked out over Jerusalem and he wept. He loved it. And they had rejected him. And a man that's filled with the Spirit tonight can look out over the church and see a people that ought to be shining with the glorious power of God. And the Holy Spirit within your heart weeps tears of regret. What have we done? God called us, our fathers, out 50 years ago, and we returned back. And you see what it's got us? A disgraceful bunch under the name of Pentecost. People who smoke, drink, married three or four times. Women who cut their hair, paint, use their shorts, wear immoral clothes, everything, call themselves Pentecostal sisters. What a disgrace. On the name of Christ. What a disgrace upon his church. No one says blasphemous names was found in Babylon. Organization. Confusion. All messed up. All kinds of this, that, and the other. Where's Christ in the whole thing? Return, people. I wonder tonight while we have our heads bound. People believe this is the truth. That we ought to return during this jubilee. It's God's last call to his church. If you do, raise up your hands to God and say, God, I want to come. Just raise your hand and say, I believe it. I believe it. All eagles now who know and believe. Our Heavenly Father, you see these hands. At least half of this audience or more has their hands up and they know that it's the truth. God of heaven, send the Holy Spirit, Lord. I see the hours are darkening. And man's heart are going wax and cold and formal. The churches has got away. But they don't know what that zeal and love and power that they know 50 years ago in the Pentecostal move. They have made themselves little caves. They've made themselves walls around them. And they cannot come out in the Jubilee. It never was so. And God, you're a God that don't change. You keep yourself the same all the time. Your commandments cannot change. Every decision is perfect. Therefore, it doesn't have to be altered. It's perfect. It's your word. Let it be tonight, Lord. Let it be that your servant everywhere, many God-fearing men, Lord, are standing these days all around over the country preaching return, return. Their faces are blushing with embarrassment. When visiting ministers come into the church and see the women and the men and the way they're doing and acting, and ministers that's filled with the Spirit, and they know their faces blush, what can they do? If they say anything about it, that organization system puts them out. Oh, God, bring them eagles out of there, Lord. Take them out of that cage. This is Jubilee. Bring them out to freedom and the Holy Spirit. Let them stand, live, or die. Our forefathers dropped out of the Methodist, Baptist, and Lutheran. Them generation after generation where they organized themselves, sold out. You called your eagles out of that pen, out of that barnyard. Lord God, you're the same God tonight. Call again, Lord. It's Jubilee time. Grant, Heavenly Father, that before this week shall end, that we'll see the power of God restoring back again. 
great signs and wonders. May the sick be healed, the cripples walk away, may the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear, the dead raised up, and the power of God be manifested in hearts. Grant us start a revival again, Lord. Bring the people out of these full, cold, formal things that they do, play a little music and dance, they call in the spirit for the rhythm of the music. Oh, God, a saint of God could dance up and down the streets or in a bar room or anywhere else for the power of God when he's dancing with the spirit and shout and praise God. They make them live different. The outside Lord of your church is expressing what's on the inside of it. Holla, shalla, creed, denomination, eat up, cankered, malignancy all over. It's a putrefied sore, surely. I pray, God, that you'll receive my offering tonight as I lay it up on this golden altar with the sacrifice Christ who taught the word. And I'm calling tonight, Lord, let your spirit bring the church back again. Grant it, Father. I commit these words to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I commit this church to you. I commit this group of people to you. Oh, Lord God, do something for us, I pray. Hear the prayer of your servant. Grant it, Lord. I ask it sincerely with all my heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You love him. Do you believe him? Do you believe it's the hour to return? We're too late to start a healing service now. We'll catch it tomorrow night. It's too late. I want to hold on to this a while. You think I'm crazy? I'm not crazy. I'm not. I know exactly what I'm talking about. I know it's the truth. The church is rotten to the core. That's right. She needs to be born again. She needs to come back to her inheritance. She needs to come back to Pentecost. She needs to come back to something. Oh, you say, I am Pentecost. Oh, brother. I'm ashamed to call myself Pentecost. Not because of the holy name of Pentecost, but because that I could be different. I want to surrender my own life. I want to put myself on God's altar and say, Lord, beat me and mold me and Take me till I'm different from what I am now. Make me yours and lead me, Lord. I've been led around too much by man. I want to be led by God's Spirit. I'm confessing this is Pentecost. I want to return back again. Let's see a revival. Amen. Do you believe that? Let's raise our hands and sing, I love you. Give us a card, sisters, if you will. Now. All right. Everybody, raise your hands and sing to the top of your voice, I love him. And when we do so, let's stand up on our feet. All together now, express that you love me. Let's be real Pentecostal. There's a Methodist standing by you, a Baptist, a Presbyterian, a Pentecostal. Let's shake one another's hands and say, God bless you, brother. Let's return. Let's say that when we turn, shake hands to everyone in here. Preach to Zeus the street exactly. Amen. Let's return. Let's raise your hand.
Jesus Christ. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I don't know no organization. I don't know nothing, but I owe it all to Him. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Praise him as your raise continues. Let's just keep our hands up. Let's just love Him. Let's just praise Him. Let's pray in our own way. Pray the way you do at church. All that wants to get a fresh baptism, raise, shake your hands back and forth. I want a fresh baptism. Oh, God. Praise Jesus. God, send the Holy Ghost upon us. Take us back, Lord, to those experiences again. Forgive us of our trespasses, Lord. And help us to come to this knowledge of the power and truth of the gospel. Bring it, Lord. Right where you're standing, right in your own way, right where you're standing, just praise God. Say, God, I'm going to accept right now, I promise you, right now, that I'll not let loose until my soul returns to that kind of an experience. How many will do that with me? Raise up your hand. I'll not turn loose. I'll hold to the altar. I love him. Send his power. Hallelujah. Send forth your prophets, Lord. Send them with the word. Don't let them compromise on a thing. Send back to the Bible, back to the Holy Ghost, back to a zeal. Raise up a church without spot or wrinkle. You promised it, Lord. You promised that we believe you. I plead for every one of us, Lord, and myself too. Send it, O oh Lord. Send the power just now. Fill every heart, I pray, Lord, that you'll send us that what we need, Lord, that you poured out 50 years ago here in the state. Pour it out again, oh, Lord God. Fill up your vials and pour the love of Christ into our hearts and make us that church that we should be, Lord. Forgiving our sins, we return tonight, Lord, as a group of people. We return as a people and as an individual. We return to our heritage, Lord, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God Almighty, you promised it. Honor it, Lord. Honor your word, I pray in Jesus' name. I... Oh, God. standing, I want this dear old patriarch of the faith 
The thing that I've been talking about, brother, it's the things that you all fought for many years ago. Absolutely. The church ought to come back to that, don't you say, brother? We've gotten away from it. To save the movement, we've got to get back. Amen. We've gone the way of all the other denominations that was good to begin with, wonderful. And step by step, they've fallen into the clutches of machinery that has been of human genius making. We've got to get back. Amen. We've got to get back. You hear the cry of that dear old saint from his heart with tears running down his face? He knows that there's souls waiting across the altar yonder. Jesus will come someday. I hope and pray that God will raise up men here and women that will go back. That will go back in spite of everything. Return back. It's jubilee. Get out of this mechanism. You can never achieve anything for God in there. You're only achieving it for an organization that's come out and achieved for God. And you can only do it by His mechanism, the Holy Ghost. That's what was given. God bless you.